system. Uh, and feel free to come to the microphones and ask questions. Um, please introduce yourself. I will, oh, I'll start out. Nigel, I was intrigued going back to early in your talk when you looking at uh, sickle cell disease and you were looking that the cellular fraction uh, had an effect on fibrinolysis and not the plasma. And you said you had some ideas and I, I was intrigued to uh, find out what those were. So the leading contender now, um, it's really interesting if you look at clots that are formed in sickle blood, there's extreme hypoxia in the middle of a clot and the cells sickle. And they don't just, you know, adopt a sickle shape, but they put out these, these long spicules, which I'm sure Russell will be very familiar with. And so we think it's, it's really as much due to that kind of um, lack of forming the polyhedrocytes, which is what you see in a normal clot that kind of can slip out and during clot retraction, that the red cells may be a significant part of that but we haven't ruled out the platelets completely yet. Um, so it could be that there are you know, much higher levels of pi-1 in sickle platelets or something, but I think it's, it's really a mechanical thing, I think, in those whole blood assays. That's interesting. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Walbert, Dr. Keith, thank you very much. That was excellent. I'm really glad to see this. Um, <coughs> Peter Slag in Penn State. So, uh, Dr. Walbert, I appreciate you showing the Plasmin gener the plasmin assay because it's very exciting from the standpoint of exogenous estrogen. We understand quite well that it causes acquired protein, uh, activated protein C resistance, but we don't really understand the effects on fibrinolysis. There appears to be uh, some changes in TPA and PI1, but there's also increases in uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And so what are, what, are, what are you able to share with what you've done so far? Is it not ready to discuss in this <coughs> setting? Uh, yeah, it's really not ready to discuss yet. Um, what we've been doing is collaborating with a couple of groups now. We've collaborated with a group in Vermont, actually, who's done this really beautiful study collecting samples. Um, over time leading up to delivery and then after delivery, and we do see some changes in plasma generation. And we've been trying to match that up with a lot of measurements of um, the, the fibrinolytic activators in the system and try to understand what the role of these are. It gets complicated because like I said, we don't think we're very sensitive to endogenous levels of TPA because we're having to trigger that with relatively high concentrations of TPA. And that um, leads us to question what we're seeing in terms of whether it's significantly elevated levels of PI-1 or whether we're still exceeding those levels in its sensitivity. Um, I can say with certainty we see differences. I can't, we just don't know yet what the molecular mechanisms are that are driving that and what role that would necessarily have in, um, in, in the as sort of hours and days subsequent to delivery when those levels are higher. We are about to get some samples from another investigator who is doing a longitudinal study of young women um, uh, first taking oral contraceptives and moving forward, and I don't know what we're going to see in that setting. And so hopefully we'll have that, but as somebody said to me, who knew it would be hard to keep teenagers in a study longitudinally? So sample collection has been challenging, and um, I hope it'll be a few months before we have enough that we're able to actually get a large enough cohort to be able to see differences. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Eric Grabowski, Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, so I have a question for each of you. So Dr. Wahlberg, uh, is, those are wonderful assays you put together with the mice. Uh, is it feasible to study newborn or weanling mice? Uh, we're interested because in pediatrics, of course, levels of plasminogen and uh, other uh, uh, fibrinolytic components are, are decreased. I think it should be. Um, the reaction, we haven't done that. Um, the reactions, we tested this in anticipation of needing to go <coughs> really small. And so we've done, we've sort of, the reaction looks a lot like thrombin generation. Um, that starts with small volumes of plasma, and we tested substantial dilutions. 
with as little as about 10 microliters of plasma, we can get pretty good measurements out. And if that's what can be obtained from um, newborn mice, we can take a look at that and be happy to collaborate. That's wonderful. Okay. <clears throat> and for Dr. Key, uh, I originally was going to ask you about whether a PI-1 concentrates or even alpha-2 antiplasma concentrates could be a therapy for hyperfibrinolysis, or perhaps that's not a good question. And, and also whether, to get back to the sickle cell question, whether the inability of sickle cells to grow low also contributes. Um, so I, the first question I think, Eric, you were asking about w using some of the inhibitors as right. a therapeutic. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in theory, yeah. I mean, I, I suspect that, that um, as I say, we, I, I think Alyssa and I share some concerns about the Rotem assay, which has sort of driven <coughs> much of the thinking of fibrinolysis. Um, I'm really a fan of the clinical trial. The clinical trial, I don't yeah. think, lies to us in terms of real early value, and that's where the fibrinolysis has to be happening. So, you know, tranexamic acid is the cheap way of inhibiting fibrinolysis um, and is shown to be beneficial, but it led to a lot of controversy among trauma surgeons uh, for reasons I didn't fully understand. I have to say, I think that they were perhaps a little bit, um, a little bit obsessed with what they were seeing in the Rotem. So, yeah, I mean, is it what the, what the window of, uh, what the therapeutic window, the safety is of giving those things, of course, but yeah, I would think so something like alpha-2 antiplasma. I don't know, um, I think we did measure those levels actually in the trauma patients. They're not that depleted. Hmm. But, you know, I don't think there's a lot of information about that. So what was the question about sickle? The question is whether the problem the difference with sickle versus normal blood may relate to the inability of sickle cells to form Rouleau. Because, you know, irregular aggregates of red cells contribute to a clot formation. Okay. Um, yeah, I think Rouleau is a, form, a, a function of, of cells in solution more than, you know, in the center of a clot. Um, I don't know if I'm addressing your question, but... Um, mm -hmm. But it's really remarkable, the, the paper that Camille Face did with Rafael Polinsky yeah. to look at the, the sickle cells within the nidus of a thrombus. And if you, you know, they're trapped there. They're not going to get anywhere. And if the PO2 is 10, which is what, what it is in the center of a venous clot, right. they are going to sickle and they're going to stay sickled. Um, and so I think our only point was that they contribute in that location yeah. to the clot. Again, I don't know if I was answering your question really. Uh, 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 sort of. Uh, what I'm referring to is that if you have very hypo uh, decreased uh, um, ionic strength in a solution, as happens say, with certain contrast media, the red cells will start to clump together and it form Rouleau with shoot offshoots, making irregular aggregates, and that can lead to clotting. And in the body, I don't know, that may also physiologically play a role in venous thrombosis, where you have near, near stasis. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I think there's lots of possibilities. It's a fascinating disease, but... Okay, thank you. Thanks. Christina Haley, Oregon Health and Science University. I might reveal my, like, lack of knowledge and get my hematology hat removed. So, thinking about the, um, that quote you shared, Dr. Key, of... Um, like from long ago of how fibrinolysis was so long and this prolonged thing that we observe. So I was wondering, why is the early administration of TXA so important if it's this really long, drawn-out process? So I think that's an important question. That um, the so so I guess my view of the world would be that there's in actively bleeding states, and this is different from prophylaxis, but actively bleeding states, presumably one of the triggers for turning on fibrinolysis is the formation of fibrin. But there's also pretty good data that TPA release, you know, is under sympathetic uh, control. And that um, there may be, and there's, there's data that suggests in trauma, for some reason we've evolved to release TPA in a situation where it would seem 
counterproductive to me, but I think that um, certainly the levels of free TPA go up and, and at least um, can be detected when you deplete the, the Pi-1. The, the eugoblin clot lysis time does not remove all the Pi-1, which is why I showed you three, three individuals who were congenitally Pi-1 deficient, and they had very rapid, um, all of them had very rapid fibrinolysis. So Pi-1 is a big driver, I think, in terms of, and it doesn't take that much to change the eugoblin clot lysis time. But I think that in trauma, I mean, we were amazed to see 50% of these individuals had evidence of, of hyperfibrinolysis. We haven't looked at the later time points, though. We haven't had those samples. So the dynamic I th question is the next question, I think, to get out with these assays, both the, you know, plasmin generation. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Berwick, maternal fetal medicine from Los Angeles. Thank you. Excellent presentations. My question also gets to that on TXA as OBGYN. Uh, we have some hesitation prophylaxis, so that's, I think, our big question. There's been widespread adoption of TXA for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage, but prevention, especially in low-risk pregnancies, has been a concern. We haven't been entirely sold by that, um, those recent publications, uh, given the limited benefit. I I'm wondering on the PGA assays, could you use that to determine who might benefit most from TXA ahead of time so that way we could reduce universal administration and maybe have a target population that would seem to benefit the most? I mean, that would be a really, that would be really exciting if we could. I, I think what that asks, you know, it would have to be done substantially in advance because there's a lot of preclinical steps that need to be done to get to the assay. The other great limitation is that it probably would not fully recapitulate what the actual cause of bleeding is um, because we're adding the thing that's triggering that process and that would be difficult to simulate. Um, it's probably worth taking a look at. I'm not sure how I'd predict how that study would actually come out, um, but if, if we can certainly try that in certain ways see. The other problem with carrying that out, I think, is just um, the number, we'd actually have to see bleeding events in order to be able to know if we were preventing bleeding, and the idea of how many samples it would take for us to look and see that it may not be feasible um, to carry out the assay. It's reasonable throughput, but probably not large enough for that setting yet. Perfect, thank you. And if I could add just one, yeah, based on that, like you said, from the data that you have, do you see that those, based on the variation of the assays, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you have bleeding complication data from those patients because it was given prophylactically. Were you able to then look at those that did and did not have bleeding complications? In that study, there was no bleeding complications. Okay. Roshni Kulkarni, Michigan State University. Outstanding talks. I'm, I'm, I'm like, my brain is reeling from fibrinogen and fibrinolysis. I just had a question. Is there like, um, if, but these assays, do they change in multiparous whereas with nulliparous women and uh, over age? You know, so the question is, from newborn who have fetal fibrinogen to a 60, 80 year old, are there differences in those assays? I think we don't know. It's a really great question. We know trauma generation certainly does change as a function of age, um, and we've been able to associate that with very specific changes in the components that drive and inhibit trauma generation. There's every reason to think that any changes that would take place in the fibrinolytic components as a function of age would also contribute in these assays. And the ability to pick that up would depend. It might actually take the suite of assays that have increased or decreased sensitivity to various components in order to tease that out. It would be really interesting to try to understand that, for example, in the newborn state where there's more procoagulant activity, is there compensatory activity? And so it'd be great to be able to look at these in parallel and, and really develop a three-dimensional appreciation of the mechanisms driving and inhibiting um, clot formation and, and fibrinolysis. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add except as someone who's aging, I'd like to know the answer, but we don't know, so. <laughs> Dan, I love to uh, thank our great speakers um, for this first session again. And, um, 
help yourself to snacks and uh, we'll resume in 15 minutes or 14 minutes.